So I mentioned to you last week that this Bible study is going to kind of be a, a, a one-off. I'm not going to really go through a series because next week we are going to be in Lent. And so I'm going to start a series next week. And that series that, I, that I'm putting together, it's based on a book written by Max Lucado called He Chose the Nails. So I don't know if any of you read it. I don't know if any of you have it at home, if that's something that you would like to read as we do this study, that would be great, but it is not required for what we are going to talk about. So what are we going to talk about today? Well, at the Schultz house, tomorrow at school is the Valentine's Day party for my kids. And they are excited. And they're excited because of the party but let's be honest, they're really more excited because they know that candy will be involved tomorrow and they've already been talking about all the treats that they can eat and you can have as much candy as your teachers tell you that you can have. Valentine's Day. Do you know that almost one billion Valentine's Day cards are sent out every Valentine's Day. And I thought, really? But then I thought, okay, the Schultz household sent out 20 each kid because each kid gets one in their schools. And just a side note, 85% of those cards are purchased by women. That's second only to the number of Christmas cards that are sent out. And the truth is, the history of Valentine's Day, it's, it, it's very weird and clouded. I mean, a lot of people talk about Valentine, Saint Valentine, but the truth is, we don't know a lot about Saint Valentine. There might have actually been three different Saint Valentines. And the kind of story is all kind of molded together into one story, and we don't really know. The, the, the most famous one, and maybe you've heard it, that that Valentine was a, was a priest or a bishop in the Roman Empire. The Roman Emperor Claudius decided that single men made better soldiers than married men. So he refused all of his people in his army to get married. And so Valentine, in secret, married some of these soldiers. And when he was found out, he was thrown into prison. And as legend goes, and this is legend, this isn't scripture, this isn't ordained word of God, but he fell in love with the jailer's daughter and wrote her a love note and signed it from your valentine. Is that true? I don't know. But that's the legend that has been brought forth. And so when we think about Valentine's Day, we think about love. And specifically, the Valentine's Day love we think of is romantic love. And because this holiday has been so associated with romantic love, I also realize that for a lot of people, Valentine's Day is very difficult. You're single. You don't want to be single, but you are. Or maybe you've gone through a breakup or a divorce. It makes it extra hard if that breakup or divorce was a hard, painful one. For many people, they've spent many times on Valentine's Day mourning the loss of their spouse who has passed away. In my time of being a pastor, I realized that Sometimes in the, in the celebrations and holidays that, that we love and we celebrate, Valentine's Day, Mother's Day, Father's Day, while we celebrate them, I also realize that it is a difficult day for some people. And I always want to acknowledge that and let them know that God loves them and cares about them. And so today... I'm not going to talk about romantic love with you. Not that I have anything against romantic love. I'm married. I love my wife. 
And if you want to read scripture about romantic love, then open up the book of Song of Songs, also called Song of Solomon, or Canticle of Canticles, or Solomon's Song of Songs. It's one of the weird books in the Bible that nobody can guarantee what the name is. And it's all about romantic love between a man and a woman. It's all about how God has ordained marriage and God has designed marriage that people should live together spiritually, emotionally, and physically. But today I want to talk about a different type of love. The love that we, as followers of Jesus Christ, are to share with God in the world. And so the story I want to look at today comes in Mark's gospel and it's also in Matthew's gospel. But today I'm just going to take a look at Mark's gospel. And when you read this section of scripture, you kind of need to find out what is happening here. Because what's going on is Jesus is teaching and he's teaching and in the crowd are religious leaders. And you read about all the time the religious leaders that Jesus deals with. And I know it can sometimes get confusing because you read about Sadducees and Pharisees. And then the scripture might call some people scribes, other people teachers of religious law. And you're just kind of figuring out like, what, what are all these guys? What are they all about? And, and maybe I'm thinking... Maybe that might be a Bible study that we could do a little later on. You know, what did the Sadducees see? What did the Pharisees believe? Who were the scribes? Who were the teachers of the law? Are they the same? Are they different? But, but that's, that's a later time. What, what is important to know is that some of them loved Jesus. Were followers of Jesus. Believed that Jesus was the Messiah. The promised one of God. However, a lot of others didn't. And they didn't like Jesus. They didn't like, first of all, who he hung out with. Because he hung out with people that they felt shouldn't be hung out with. Because they were no good scum. They didn't like that Jesus challenged their authority. Or challenge their interpretation on the law. They didn't like most of all though. That crowds of people flocked to see Jesus. Why? Because Jesus was healing people. Jesus was teaching and they talk about it. They say, wow, this man Jesus, he teaches way better than any of the Pharisees or Sadducees ever did. So they didn't like crowds were following him. Because that meant crowds weren't following them. However, another reason that they didn't like the crowds, and this is what ultimately led to Jesus' execution, because crowds meant that Rome was watching. And Rome was in charge. And so if Jesus had this big crowd of people following him, they were feared that Rome might view that as a possible revolt or insurrection coming up. And Rome would not hesitate to go in and wipe them out. And that's exactly what happened about 40 years after Jesus' death and resurrection. There was a great Jewish revolt. Rome came in. They wiped out the people. Thousands were crucified and sold into slavery. They ransacked the city of Jerusalem and even destroyed the temple itself. So that's why Caiaphas said when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and more and more crowds were following, he needs to go. It's either our life in the temple or his. And so it was his. And so the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day... They wanted to do what they could to keep the crowds from following Jesus. And so oftentimes, they would ask him questions. Questions that they knew, whatever the answer is, he can't give a good answer. Because if he says this, the people will be mad at him. If he says that, Rome will be mad at them. 
One of the best examples happens right before the passage that we're going to look at. Because they went to Jesus one day and they said, Jesus, is it right to pay taxes to Caesar? Now the actual Hebrew or Greek word that was used there didn't mean taxes like you necessarily pay your income taxes each week. It was more like tribute. Do we need to pay tribute to Caesar? Caesar required that you pay money to him to give him honor for just being Caesar. And so Jesus does something brilliant. He says, who has a coin? And the coin that the person had was probably the tribute coin that you were supposed to give for this tribute. That's all its purpose was. And so the person who had it probably shouldn't have it. And he says, whose picture's on it? Whose inscription's written on it? And they're called Caesar. So remember Jesus' words? Well then, Jesus said, give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar. And give to God what belongs to God. His reply completely amazed them. It's Caesar's. Give it to him. It's got his picture on it. It belongs to him. But what belongs to God? Give that to him. And so as they heard this, the scripture tells us, one of the teachers of religious law was standing there, listening to the debate. He realized that Jesus had answered well, and so he asked, of all the commandments, which is the most important? And so they move from the Caesar thing, and they begin debating, and the debate they're talking about here is, one of them asks, okay, a guy gets married, his wife dies, he marries again, she dies, he marries again, she dies, he marries again. Actually, it's a woman. Her husband dies, she gets remarried, her husband dies. And so in, in the resurrection, who will she be married to? And I know this is going to sound horrible because I'm talking about Valentine's Day earlier. But I'm sorry to say this. But scripture teaches that in the resurrection, we won't be married. For when the dead rise, they will neither marry nor be given in marriage. In this respect, they will be like the angels in heaven. But let's go back to what, after this debate, they're standing there, a teacher of religious law came up to Jesus and he said, of all the commandments, what is the most important commandment? And when I say commandments, your minds go to where? Ten commandments. That's the first thing we think of when I say commandments. We go to the ten commandments. But do you know that there are a lot more than ten commandments in the scriptures? Torah. The books of Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. Also called the Pentateuch, or the books of Moses. Or also the books of the law. If you would read through all of those, and Jewish scholars and scribes have been doing it for centuries, they actually come up with 613 different commandments or laws for the nation of Israel. And Jesus knew this. And so this person was trying to say, out of all the 613, what's the most important? Have you ever tried to read through the Bible cover to cover? You know what happens? You get through Genesis. You get through Exodus. And then you hit Leviticus. And you read through Leviticus and you go, what? 
What is going on here? This is confusing. This makes no sense. Do I have to follow this? Do I have to believe this? Is this what's happening? Because you read stuff like this. Leviticus 19.19. 19. You must obey all my decrees. Do not mate two different kinds of animals. Do not plant your fields with two different kinds of seeds. Don't wear clothing woven from two different kinds of thread. And God says, you must follow this decree. And you went, okay, okay. You know what? I can understand the first part of this decree. You know, I'm not going to take my dog and my cat and try to have them mate and create some dog-cat kind of thing. But, God, are you telling me that in my garden I can't plant green beans and squash? God, are you telling me that my jacket that's made of cotton and poly or whatever is against God's commands to wear? And that's tough for us. And then, as you read through the Torah, and as you read through Leviticus, you read commands that God says, the punishment for these is death. And you go, death? Leviticus 24, 16. Anyone who blasphemes the name of the Lord must be stoned to death by the whole community of Israel. A native-born Israelite or a foreigner among you who blasphemes the name of God must be put to death. Or how about this one? Leviticus 29. Anyone who dishonors father or mother must be put to death. Such a person is guilty of a capital offense. Now I'm not here to debate capital punishment. But I think all of us, whether we agree with capital punishment or don't, can understand capital punishment for something big like murder or treason. But God says if you blaspheme the name of the Lord, if you take the name of the Lord in vain, you should be put to death. If you disobey, dishonor your mother and father, the punishment can be death. That's hard for us to wrap our heads around. And so, Pastor Phil, what does this have to do with a story that you were telling us before about Valentine's Day and how we as followers of Jesus are to love God and other people? Well, let me explain. And if I get too crazy for you, wave your hand and stop and ask me questions. But to understand this story, you need to go back to the beginning of the story. For in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And when God created the heavens and earth, Scripture said that God looked out on his creation and saw that it was good. And so God put man in a garden, Adam and Eve, in the Garden of Eden. And God was with them, and he lived with them, and he dwelt with them. And in that garden, there was no pain, there was no suffering, there was no sorrow, there was no death. All of that was not there. It was perfection. They lived with God in his kingdom, and they wanted for nothing. However, man and woman created in the image of God, sinned. And when they sinned, death entered the world. And it changed everything. And since then, humankind has sinned. We've rebelled. We've told God we don't need him or we can do things better on our own. But God made a promise 
that he would deliver humanity from sin. And so that promise began to unfold. And it began to unfold through a man named Abram. And God told Abram that through him, all the people of the world will be blessed. Genesis 22. This is what the Lord says. Because you have obeyed me and not withheld even your son, your only son, I swear by my own name that I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond numbers, like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the city of their enemies, and through your descendants, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. God tells Abram, we know him as Abraham, that you will have a family, and through your family, I will bless the world. And so Abraham had a son. His name was Isaac. And Isaac, he had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. And through Jacob, he had 12 sons. Do you remember them? Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Isaac, Zebulun, Joseph, and Benjamin. And if you remember the story, Joseph was his favorite son. Why? Because he came from his favorite wife. And his brothers didn't like him. So they sold him into slavery. And you can read the story, but eventually he can have the ability to interpret dreams. He interprets the dream of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And the dream says, for seven years, Egypt will have plenty of food. But after that, there will be seven years of famine. And so God uses Joseph to save the people from starvation. Joseph is given the position of second in all of Egypt, only below the Pharaoh. And through a series of events, he is reunited with his family. And they all move to Egypt. And the book of Exodus begins that this family in Egypt has grown and become bigger. And eventually Pharaoh, who did not know about Joseph or did not care about Joseph. And we go, how did he not know about Joseph? Well, if you go to Egypt, I've never been but sometimes you'll see some of the, the carvings and stuff, and they have basically chiseled out people from history that they don't want to be remembered. They wipe you out. So that very easily could happen. But Pharaoh looks around and says, there are all these Israelites. They're called Israelites because God changed Jacob's name to Israel. Or they're also known of as Hebrews. Where do we get the name Hebrews? We don't know. But he said, if they would follow our enemies, they could wipe us out. And so they enslave them. Eventually God raises up one of them, a man named Moses, to lead this family out of slavery in Egypt and into a land that he promised them. And as he led them out of Egypt, God led them to Mount Sinai. And on Mount Sinai, God makes a covenant with this people. This is what it says. Then Moses went up to the God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the descendants of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did in Egypt. And how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all the nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words that you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders of the people and set before them the words of the Lord commanded to him to speak. The people all responded, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back 
to the Lord. Oops. God gives them a choice. People, do you want to show the nations of the world what I am like? Do you want to show the nations of the world that you are different? And that I'm different? I'm different from all the false gods that they worship? This covenant with you. And the covenant was established. And the first part of the covenant is the Ten Commandments. Ten ethical laws that are given for all mankind. However, God also gave them ritual laws. Ritual laws that were only intended for the nation of Israel, who was in a covenant relationship with God. Things like keeping kosher and the Sabbath laws. And some of the laws that were given, and you read through them, some of these laws are for basic health. They keep them healthy and safe. However, other laws, the laws that we might read sometimes and go, these sound weird. These don't make sense. The laws like you can't mix seeds in a field or you can't mix fabric together. These laws were intended to show the nation of Israel that God is holy. And you can't mix these other people's gods in with me because I am different. There are also laws about morality and social justice. And they were supposed to be an example to the other nations around them that God, Yahweh, the Lord, the one true God, he was different from everyone else. Questions about that before I, I move on? About some of these weird laws that they were required to keep? Ed? We'll get there. So what about the death penalty? Because we're looking going, I've dishonored my mom and dad. I should be... And this might be hard to hear, but do you know the truth? Every sin in God should result in the death penalty. Because sin is serious. Romans 6.23 in the New Testament tells us, for the wages of sin is death. In other words, what you get for sin, what you earn for sin is death. We deserve death, eternal separation from God. However, God established a system of forgiveness. He gave priests and the sacrificial system because he says sin is so serious for it to be forgiven, something must die. But the truth is, this old system that God established in Torah, it was never meant to be permanent. Hebrews in the New Testament tells us the old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of God's good things to come, not the good things themselves. The sacrifice under that system was repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If it could provide perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped, for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time, and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. 
For it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sin. This system that God entailed was only, was only a preview. It never fully washed away sins. It was only a preview of the ultimate sacrifice that God himself would make by dying on the cross for us. But do you know what happened? Right off the bat, they broke the covenant. First commandment. You must not have any other gods before me. You must not make for yourself an idol of any kind or an image of everything in heaven and or earth or in the sea. You must not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God who will not tolerate your affection for any other God. I lay the sins of the parents on their children. The entire family is affected. Even children in the four, third and fourth generations, those who rejected me. But I lavish unfailing love for a thousand generations on those who love me and obey my commands. Do you remember the story of what happened when Moses was on Mount Sinai and they were getting the law? Do you remember what they built? A what? Golden calf. God hadn't even finished all the terms of the covenant and they broke the first one. And they were punished for it. Do you know what the punishment Moses gave them was for making the golden calf? And you thought your parents were tough when they made you do stuff? He, Moses, took the calf that they had made and burned it. Then he ground it into power, threw it into water, and forced the people to drink it. However, that's the story of the nation of Israel and God. He gives them this covenant and they break it. But he forgives them and restores them. But they break it again and he forgives it and restores them. And they break it again and forgives it and restores them. And it even reaches the point where they don't trust God anymore. They go to the promised land. And as they're at the promised land, they look and some of them say, we can't take this over. These people are too big. These people are too powerful. There's no way you can give us this land. And I'm sure God's like, did you just miss what I did back in Egypt with the most powerful nation in the world? But they don't trust God. So he punishes them. He gives them a time out. A 40 year time out to wander in the desert. And everyone who left Egypt died and would not enter the promised land. But what does that have to do with us and what God is teaching? Ed asked earlier, are we required to keep the law of Moses? Matthew tells us, one of them, an expert in religious law, tried to trap Jesus with this question. And what was that question? Of all the commandments, what's the greatest? And so Jesus answers, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord your God, the Lord is the one and only God. And you must love your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is equally important. Love your neighbor as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. Jesus said, do you want to know what the greatest commandment is? Love God. Love God. Love God with your everything. With your heart, with your soul, with your mind, with your strength. Everything that you have and everything that you do and everything that you are all about, the first and foremost thing that you should do is you should love 
God. And number two, and it's just as important, love others. Love others as you have loved yourself. We call that the golden rule. And sneak peek for Sunday, Jesus takes that one step further before he dies. But we'll talk about that on Sunday. Ed, are we required to keep all those laws of Moses? We are required to keep the ethical laws. The laws given to us in the Ten Commandments. However, those ritual laws, we are not in a covenant relationship with God like the nation of Israel. We are people under the New Covenant, the New Testament. Do you remember what Jesus says when he institutes the Lord's Supper? Jesus took wine and after giving thanks, he gave it to his disciples and say, take, drink. This is the new covenant in my blood which has been shed for you. You're not under the old covenant. You're under the new covenant. We are to love God and love others. And how do we love others? We'll pay attention on Sunday to figure that out. I'll give you the sneak peek. Jesus says you are to love others as he has loved us. I know I dumped a lot of you stuff on you now. But do you have any questions, anything else about what Jesus teaches here? I'll just tell you this personally as a pastor and more importantly as a follower of Jesus Christ. Because I've seen it before and maybe you've seen it. And I've seen it on TV and I've seen it on stuff and they'll, and they'll pull out one of those Leviticus laws and they'll say, well, the, the law of Moses says that you're not supposed to eat bacon. And you eat bacon. So are you breaking God's law? The Bible says right here, don't eat bacon. It doesn't say bacon because bacon wasn't invented yet, but it says pork or whatever. And my response, I'm not in a covenant relationship with God because I'm not part of the nation of Israel who is on a covenant relationship with God. I'm in a relationship with Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ said, don't misunderstand why I have come. I did not come to abolish the laws of Moses or the writings of the prophets. No, I came to accomplish their purpose. Their purpose was to show us a holy God. Their purpose was to show us that we were sinners. Their purpose was to show us that we could not save ourselves that we needed someone to save us and rescue us. Friends, in the Lutheran tradition, we often talk about law and gospel. The law does not save us, but the gospel does. The good news of Jesus Christ. That we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. And because we are saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ... We are to go and love God and love others. Questions, comments before I wrap stuff up today? Well, let me just close us in a word of prayer. Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for loving us. We thank you for the new covenant. We thank you for the forgiveness that we have, not with the blood of bulls and goats, but in Jesus Christ. As followers of his, let us love God with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength and love our neighbors as ourselves 
To you alone be all glory, honor, and worship. In Jesus' holy name we pray. Amen.